Alexander Vinay and Soren Kierkegaard's Individualism. Excerpts from Christian Ethics by Hans Lassen Martinson. Published in 1871. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alexander Vinay and Soren Kierkegaard's Individualism. Beginning on page 204. The one-sided socialism is found everywhere in which society in that sense is made the ultimate aim so that the individual becomes only the means and instrument for society without at the same time being an object in itself it appears in the states of ancient times and we may describe plato's republic as socialistic in this sense of the term it is thus genuinely socialistic when he desires that children should be taken from their parents and brought up in a state institution in order that they may not be spoiled by parental indulgence or when he proposes that the choice of a partner in marriage should not be free but determined by the representatives of the state so that only those men and women should marry each other from whom may be expected the procreation of the healthiest and most virtuous children for the state but not only in the pagan world does socialism appear but also in christianity catholicism is socialistic for though in theory it acknowledges the eternal dignity of the individual and its destiny to eternal bliss yet the community takes on itself through the hierarchy to care for the blessedness of individuals and holds the individual in a constant state of pupillage and subjection under a yoke of human precepts and decrees the inquisition the stake and censure are moments in this socialism the first aim of which is the maintenance of the existing society a tout prix. The confessional state which binds all citizens to the same profession and does not tolerate any deviation of doctrine is socialistic, as it asserts the claim of itself and its decrees to be absolute and denies the right of personal conviction. But also from the standpoint of liberalism and emancipation, in which liberty so often passes over into thraldom, socialism appears. Thus in the French Revolution, in the reign of terror, in which the mere suspicion of cherishing a political sentiment different from those of the men in power brought death, because the common weal was endangered by such suspected individuals thus also in that system which calls itself socialism and communism and which however fantastic and impracticable is yet very worthy of attention as a tendency it starts from the idea of the human race as the highest to which the individuals are subordinate and also from the idea of the perfect equality of men's rights and thus the equality of those of individuals as the temporary representatives of the race on this basis socialism desires to organize a great universal economy a vast community with organization of labor with equality in property and enjoyment equality in information and refinement which if it could be accomplished must annihilate all individuality and though it promises the individual happiness would subject him to the most frightful tyranny stretching him on the procrustus bed of the system if however we look away from the peculiar forms in which the principle appears and if we inquire what metaphysic forms the basis of this theory which degrades the individual into the subjected means for society we arrive at pantheism which only regards the universal as the essential and the individual as the temporary accident pantheism in its application to human society and history contemplates the individuals of the race only as disappearing drops in the ocean whilst the ocean itself in the unbroken motion of its waves is the actually existing and real in opposition to this it is right to bring forward the principle of individuality 
and they who have done so in the spirit of Christianity, and laid down a protest against the social pantheism of our day, deserve all thanks and acknowledgment. But there is also a one-sided individualism, an isolation of the individual, which only seeks to be its own aim, without at the same time being a ministering member. Where this individualism becomes practical and obtains diffusion, it may really have an influence hostile to society. The ideal of individualism achieved would be a world of personal atoms, which are mutually attracted and repulsed by each other, but even when they associate themselves, never can attain further unity than a mere contract of combination, which may be again dissolved at pleasure, because unity and totality, which are presupposed by parts, totum est partibus prius, and which form the mystery of life and organization, are perfectly alien to it. Individualism may, like socialism, appear in different circles of life, and we may thus speak of a political, an ecclesiastical, and a religious individualism. This religious individualism has in our century unquestionably found its most important and its noblest expression in Alexander Venet. In opposition to the social pantheism which would annul everything individual and concrete, would dethrone personality and make the universal one and all, he with great eloquence exalts the individual as the actually existing, sets this forth as the object of the work of creation. Individuality is the stamp which God has impressed on every human being, his own possession entrusted to him by his maker, and which he should maintain and protect against the dangers which threaten him on the side of society. For though society, la société, in one respect is the condition for the development of the individual, and no one can escape from society, yet society has a natural tendency to efface and obliterate individuality. We are all originals at birth, for in every individual that comes into the world, even in the least gifted and most insignificant, we can perceive an intention of providence to form a being which is different from all others, and which thus has never existed before. But although we are all born originals, yet most of us die as imitations, for society, la société, has a tendency to rub off peculiarities and produce similarity amongst individuals. The weaker members of the community are brought by the force of example, by prejudice and convenience, by the entire legion of social influences, gradually to lose their individuality. They make themselves mere instruments for the whole, and offer, so to speak, their individuality as a contribution to the great general fund of society, where it disappears as in an abyss. And yet the individual, as Venet again and again urges, is higher than society, because it is destined to relation with God, to a living and direct union with God, to which society is not destined, as it is only indirectly related to God. It is the privilege of the individual, even the lowliest and most insignificant, to exist for God, to have the capacity of eternal happiness or eternal perdition. Not society, but the individual anticipates a future life, an immortality beyond the grave. And it is only the individual that believes, hopes, obeys, suffers, and loves, it is only the individual who in his conscience is bound and responsible, the individual that is the real object of God's attention and his judgment, the individual who ought to be presented and is daily presented before the judgment seat of the eternal. It is not to humanity in abstracto, not to society, but to the individual that the gospel addresses itself with its requirements and its promises. It is to the individual that God says in his word, Come now, and let us reason together. Isaiah 1, 13. Society, 
la societe is not a being un etre but only an arrangement between personal beings or seen from another point of view society is an ocean on which the individual soul is cast forth in a little bark to seek the way through the rough billows to the shores of a new world where it may land both the ocean and the bark are worthy of admiration the bark which each one of us is called to steer and in which we are to reach the land in yon new world is our own individuality another not myself guides the waves and appoints their way over the great abyss but the bark is my own and the ocean is on account of the bark not the bark on account of the ocean for the principal concern purpose object is that the bark should land that the human individual which alone stands in immediate relation to god and is the special object of the work of creation should fulfil its destiny all depends therefore on the right steering of the bark for as the sea the fluid element which is less fluid than air and less solid than earth has the twofold capacity to bear up the bark or to engulf it so also with regard to the fluid social element on which individuality is launched one may founder in the ocean of society as well as on that of the material world and it would be of little avail to examine on which of the two oceans the most frequent shipwrecks occur this exaltation of individuality expresses certainly a sacred and precious truth but not the whole truth no one will thus be able to deny the deep practical truth in the last figure employed of the individual cast forth on the ocean in his little bark which is to reach the shore at length but if we are to speak in figures we are acquainted with another emblem of the voyage of man's life we are reminded of the gospel picture of christ with his disciples on the lake of gennesareth where the lord stilled the tempest and the boisterous waves and guided the disciples unharmed to the shore in this we have an emblem of the church as a ship which sails across the stormy sea of society in this picture the voyage is made in company with others who are all united under the same master and we are reminded that we if we hope to land at last must be in the right ship and with the right companions and have the master on board this emblem is certainly not less just than the first and expresses a side of the matter which in venet's theory of individuality does not appear certainly it too may be taken in a one-sided manner for if any one should suppose that because he was outwardly within the vessel of the church because he outwardly belonged to the community of the true church that therefore he must infallibly land on the shores of bliss he has fallen into a dreadful air and as a fitting corrective the first emblem may be employed that each one must embark in the vessel of his own individuality and pay good heed that he be not swamped by the waves or as s kierkegaard has expressed the idea that every man must navigate the sea of this world in his own little kayak now we go to page two hundred and seventeen what has been charged against venet is true in the greater degree in regard to s kierkegaard who with great talent and powerful one-sidedness has been with us the advocate of individualism as his support of individualism forms a remarkable episode in danish literature we shall dwell at somewhat greater length on the matter although the principal consideration has been already discussed in reference to venet so that what follows on it may be regarded as an episode in the present work as with venet the contrast between individualism and socialism also with kierkegaard goes back to a higher namely the contrast between individualism and universalism it thus becomes necessary for the clearer understanding of the point to return to the consideration of this last by universalism then we understand that tendency of mind which places the universal highest 
as now the most universal of all things are pure ideas and categories so philosophic idealism as panlogism must be the purest universalism this theory found as is notorious its representation in our day in the philosophy of hegel for this philosophy in which it is carried out in its purity must change the whole of existence into an ideal realm a world of ideas every form of reality nature and history is contemplated only as a form or phase of thought and religion itself is only valid as a lower form of knowledge a possession of the absolute in the form of representation whilst philosophy had the truth in the form of conception human personality human individualities were only temporary representatives of ideas or mutes in the drama which the ideal from eternity performs for itself for history is in reality not the history of man but the history of ideas in combination with this philosophic element there prevailed at that time a poetic artistic idealism which indifferent to the individual value or content of art puts forward the universal the beautiful form as the essential and therefore dwells with equal interest on every work of art collecting its material now from antiquity now from modern times from heaven or from earth from the great or the small if only the universal or form of beauty be present the speculative and the ascetic were for this tendency of mind the highest where this is consistently carried out which however is not the case with hegel himself for in his idealistic representations there is to be found a not inconsiderable woof of reality by which means an ambiguity appears and after a time mystification is inevitable consistently carried out i say this must also become the highest aim for the individual in the repose of contemplation to linger in the aerial hall of universalism with its broad prospects its logical columns and pillars its ascetic pictures from all times and all regions of the earth those pictures which as the ideal transfiguration of reality are far superior to the immediate reality itself in those days there was also much discussion about the logical the speculative and the ascetic bath which was sometimes represented as a water bath in the heraclitic streams of infinity sometimes as an air bath in the eternal and changeless ether of pure idea just as it was also regarded as the true art of life through the finite to inhale the breath of infinity in this speculative and ascetic intoxication about ideas it had only been forgotten that there was one idea which had entirely disappeared namely the religious ethical idea which does not rest satisfied with a mere ideal being a being in thought but demands existence against this universalism must therefore come forth a reaction both from the side of philosophy and theology a protest in the name of ethics and religion of personality and individuality the individual both in men and things for even the mere knowledge of experience especially the natural sciences must make protest against a merely idealistic treatment both in the worlds of nature and of mind the microscopic contemplation is now placed in contrast to the telescopic as applied to infinity and the senses developed for the small matters lying close to man yet often unperceived by him all depends however on the more intimate condition of this reaction whether the child is to be cast out with the bath whether universalism in every sense is to be rejected or whether a higher union of universalism and individualism of ideal and reality is to be attempted we find ourselves here again in the midst of the problem of the middle ages concerning realism and nominalism but in modern form the terms in use are certainly quite different for what the middle ages called realism we call idealism 
and what was then designated nominalism we style empiricism but the matter itself is entirely the same which may also be seen by the predicates which were employed in the middle ages with regard to the realists who were called formalizantes metaphysicantes which answers exactly to the idealists of our day in the nominalistic reaction here referred to proceeding from the essential interest in so far as this moves in the spheres of ethics and religion kierkegaard takes up a peculiar position he considers it as the misfortune of the age to know too much and with all this knowledge to have forgotten what it is to exist and the significance of the term subjectiveness that in view of the ascetic the speculative the history of the world it has forgotten that the main point is to be an individual man that the age by becoming objective has forgotten that it is the business of every human being to remain subjective he has therefore made it the aim of his life to promote and carry through the category the individual should he ask for an inscription on his grave he desires no other than this the individual man if this category of s kierkegaard is not understood by the present generation he is yet persuaded that it will be understood in time coming in so far as s kierkegaard claims this category as a sort of discovery and admits no other predecessor to himself in it except socrates this is only quite correct in reference to the highly individual manner in which he has maintained this category and which doubtless may be described as a hapax legomenon already before him alexander venet had introduced the same category and by his noble eloquence had procured for it a distinguished position in literature at the time when s kierkegaard appeared individualism was already in full activity by the side of universalism but in general it may be said that this category the individual is common to all those who certainly in a far more comprehensive sense than either venet or kierkegaard desire to uphold the principle of personality to maintain the personality of god and of man in opposition to pantheism the individual is the category of nominalism and rightly understood and when all has been heard that is to say when nominalism does not exclude but includes realism nominalism is the highest the individual is higher than the abstract the personal than the impersonal only the individual exists has actual being existentia est singularum as the scholastics expressed it whilst the universal has only ideal existence and only in its union with the individual attains to actual being the individual is the category of christianity and of theism for god also not indeed in a worldly sense but in a supermundane is the individual not the indeterminate universal not the abstract but the perfect threefold one which though comprehending and embracing all the possible and actual yet in the most decided manner is distinct from the universe from a former period we may here refer to the antagonism between leibniz and spinoza because the former in opposition to the all-absorbing ocean of substance set forth by spinoza determines both god and creation as monads as individual beings and causes the universal to be received into the individual in our time we may refer to schelling according to his more recent system which he has now brought into connected order whilst hegel sets forth the universal as the actually existing and lets this determine its own destinies and itself move to its concretions the later schelling in this agreeing with aristotle sets forth the individual as the actually existing not as though he denied the value of ideas of universal concepts but the ideal only arrives at participation in actual being in existence by becoming the attribute of the individual and god is to him the absolute individual being who invests himself with the universal 
whilst hegel says that it is the universal which individualizes itself schelling says that on the contrary it is the individual which universalizes itself he inquires whence the universal should obtain the power to individualize itself and put itself into existence which may also be expressed thus that not thought as the universal and ideal but the will as the essence of existence is the supreme principle which has the power to determine itself and others reason is to him only the sum total the complete number of the divine possibilities the circle of the predicates through which the absolute individual being makes itself intelligible reason the mere realm of ideas is but cannot attain existence except by the will besides schelling we may also mention franz bader and his determinate christian theism the younger fichte too who by his theory of personality which had reference to the teaching of leibniz upholds the individual and monadic as the really actual but that which philosophy seeks for theology possesses namely in revelation it is indubitably the metaphysic of revelation that not the impersonal ideal but the personal existence not thought but will not wisdom but love is the first principle in god as on the other side it tells us that the almighty love only exists and reveals itself in the form of wisdom and when the scriptures present to us the kingdom of god as the highest in existence it undoubtedly tells us that not the impersonal universal not impersonal ideals operations and powers but the individual personal existences are first in value but tells us likewise that these personal existences can only develop themselves through an organization which includes a system of ideas and powers it is not meant that all this about existence and idea about the individual and the universal is empty and barren metaphysics which would have no bearing on ethics on the contrary it has the most important bearing on the ethical relation of man and specially imposes on the individual the problem in the solution of which redeeming grace will assist namely in the effort to express the unity of existence and ideal of will love and apprehension of individual life and social life because every dualism here is of evil although metaphysical problems like that concerning nominalism and realism may seem to be alien and far apart from ethics yet they are still intimately associated with it because all metaphysical problems gravitate as it were towards the ethical centre therein and therein find their ultimate determination and just those ethical categories which show themselves daily always lying near us are when rightly understood the highest metaphysics the deepest grounds for speculation kierkegaard's assertion is therefore perfectly justifiable that with the category of the individual the cause of christianity must stand and fall that without this category pantheism has conquered unconditionally from this at a glance it may be seen that kierkegaard ought to make common cause with those philosophic and theological writers who specially desire to promote the principle of personality as opposed to pantheism this is however very far from being the case for those views which upheld the category of existence and personality in opposition to this abstract idealism did not do this in the sense of an either or but in that of a both and they strove after unity of existence and idea which may be specially seen from the fact that they desired system totality with kierkegaard on the other hand during this progressive development existence comes into more and more negative relation towards the ideal for which reason he first and last combats speculation and system it was not his aim to dislodge one speculation by another one system by another he desired a metabasis of an entirely different genus 
directly no doubt he only turns his polemics against the system of hegel he finds as has been already said that the age in its great knowledge large ascetics and extensive universal history has forgotten the real significance of existence and subjectivity the category of the individual interests him therefore only in the sense of the individual existing man he has arrived at the perception that subjectivity is the truth a doubtful proposition in regard to which it may be observed that there is but one human subjectivity concerning whom it can be expressed namely that one who in the highest sense may be called the individual in human history and who alone can say i am the truth that great individual who came into the world to make himself universal to impart himself to all by instituting the holy catholic church whilst every other human subjectivity can only through him become participant in the truth but can never be the truth kierkegaard has discovered that what the age from its great knowledge and its decline into the objective specially requires is a socrates who in his apprehension must be a sort of trainer or guide to christ socrates 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 yea we may well call thrice upon thy name it would not be too much to call upon it ten times if that could avail aught some people are of opinion that the world requires a republic that it requires a fresh organization of society and a new religion but no one perceives that it is just a socrates of which this world perplexed by its great knowledge stands in need footnote from sickness unto death by soren kierkegaard and footnote but whilst he now a socratic like turns against speculation in order to make difficulties and to disperse like vapour this imaginary knowledge evoking soberness and circumspection he turns at the same time indirectly for directly he has never entered on the subject to combat these philosophical and theological speculations which seek precisely to work out his own category though in a far more universal sense than he has done all these views he classes together under the names of speculation and mediation without in any way permitting himself to institute a closer examination into their internal diversities especially the diversity in the position they assume towards revelation a mode of proceeding which does not evince socratic caution this reckless polemic against speculation which in so many respects is entirely uncritical and merely an attacking flank finds however a mitigating explanation in his individual pathos for as there are exhibited to us from different periods of the history of science many examples of persons whose enthusiasm was entirely logical whose passion was the ideal and the purely scientific so that in this passion of theirs they insulted the material and closed their eyes to the actual and its most evident facts of this the elder fichte is an instance so on the other hand existence and the actual constitute the passion of kierkegaard making him regardless of the ideal which could not but be avenged on existence itself causing this lastly to be finally clipped of its fair proportions existence the individual will subjectivity unmitigated selfishness the paradox faith scandal happy and unhappy love by these and kindred categories of existence kierkegaard appears intoxicated nay thrown as it were into a state of ecstasy therefore he declares war against all speculation and also against such persons who seek to speculate on faith and strive after an insight into the truths of revelation for all speculation is a loss of time leads away from the subjective into the objective from the actual to the ideal is a dangerous distraction and all mediation betrays existence leads treacherously away from the decided in actual life is a falsifying of faith by the help of idea 
although he himself is amply endowed with imagination yet the course of his individuality throughout the various stages of its development may be described as a continued dying to the ideal in order to reach the actual which to him is the true and which just receives its value from the ideal glories which must be cast aside in order to attain it kierkegaard's deepest passion is not merely the ethical not merely the ethical religious but the ethical religious paradox it is christianity itself such as this exhibits itself to his apprehension christianity is to him the divinely absurd credo quia absurdum not merely the relative paradox namely in relation to the natural man ensnared in sin and worldliness which has been the doctrine of scripture and of the church from the beginning but the absolute paradox which must be believed in defiance of all reason because every ideal every thought of wisdom is excluded therefrom and in every case is absolutely inaccessible to man faith is to him the highest actual passion which thrilled by the consciousness of sin and guilt appropriates to itself the paradox in defiance of the understanding and from which all comprehension all contemplation are excluded as it is of a purely practical nature a mere act of the will not the less is everything for him dialectic but this dialectic is a disuniting dialectic of existence which develops the relation of the individual to the various spheres of existence develops specially the internal contradictions in the problem of faith and why it must be believed in virtue of the absurd just as on the other side it unfolds the incongruity between speculation and existence in which it is only to be regretted that speculation obtains such an imperfect hearing and must submit to refutation in forms under which it cannot recognize itself it may be complained that existence particularly the fact of revelation is so imperfectly exhibited as that god's becoming man in christ or as he terms it plain on the word god's coming into existence Gudens tilblivels which is to him the paradox is represented as an entirely isolated fax a deus ex machina without any connection with the economy of revelation and its universal principles on which he does not venture doubtless because he would thus be brought too deeply into the ideal and the objective and that thus too much wisdom and intellect would be brought into the whole only the individual in his personal relation to god is the subject of his interest and this existential pathos which predominates the dialectic is the guiding viewpoint for the voluminous authorship of kierkegaard end of alexander venet and soren kierkegaard's individualism by hans lassen martinson published in eighteen seventy one